The U.S. has enough nuclear weapons to destroy life on Earth 50 times over. We have 800 military bases in 80 countries around the world and a military budget larger than the next seven countries combined. The enormous Pentagon budget that eats up over 50% of our discretionary funds is supported by both Democrats and Republicans. Both parties get millions of dollars from the weapons companies who are the greatest beneficiaries of the military industrial complex. The five largest US weapons companies are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, and Raytheon. They all make billions of dollars every year selling weapons to the Pentagon, as well as to repressive regimes. The United States is the largest exporter of weapons in the world. Israel uses American weapons and U.S. military aid, now totaling $3.8 billion annually, to maintain an over 50-year-long hostile military occupation of Palestine. U.S. weapons sales to Saudi Arabia are enabling a bombing campaign and blockade of Yemen that has resulted in the worst humanitarian disaster of modern times. Cholera and famine reign, and civilian attacks have included the bombings of markets, hospitals, weddings, funerals, and a school bus killing 44 young children. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Our military has been in Korea, Cuba, Vietnam, the Dominican Republic, Lebanon, Grenada, Panama, and Kuwait. After the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. military invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, where it remains today 17 years later. The U.S. military footprint is all over the Middle East, with no end in sight. The effects of U.S. wars and military engagements have tragic consequences for the next generations to come. Decades of U.S. military engagement in Central America has resulted in gangs and violence and a refugee crisis on our border, one that is being answered with no compassion for children or their families. Destabilization in the Middle East has given rise to ISIS and an enormous refugee crisis in Syria as families flee for their lives. Along with the devastation wrecked overseas, U.S. citizens also pay the price of militarism. Health issues, poor care of veterans, systemic racism, militarized policing, immigrant injustice, oppression of indigenous First Nation people, Islamophobia, poverty, environmental devastation, and inferior funding of education, health care, and a social safety net system. These are only some of the effects. In the face of militarism, nonviolent resistance and dissent become essential. Thankfully, in America and across the world, people are organizing. Veterans are leaving the military and speaking out. In Korea, Palestine, Japan, the US, and more, activists are protesting. Groups are working on divestment, and members of Congress are even introducing legislation on issues such as stopping U.S. weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. The U.S. war in Afghanistan is now in its 17th year. Estimates of the death toll from the Iraq war are a staggering 2.4 million. U.S. military interventions in the Middle East have utterly destabilized the region and given rise to more terrorists. U.S. military aid to Israel is enabling an over 51-year-long military occupation, and U.S. weapons sales to Saudi Arabia are part of a war so catastrophic that Yemen is now the worst humanitarian crisis on Earth. We maintain 800 military bases 
around the world, but struggle to provide education, health care, clean water, and other basic services to our own people. Please join us now for this important town hall special, the U.S. War Machine, what's happening and how can we stop the violence? I'm Arielle Gold, and I'm excited to welcome you to this special program on militarism, a joint production of Code Pink, Free Speech TV, and Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We're coming to you from the facilities of Manhattan Neighborhood Network in New York City. In the coming hour, we'll discuss the current wars America is involved in, the revolving door of the military-industrial complex, the effects of militarism on our communities, and what we can do to stop the war machine and build a more peaceful world. We'll be talking with special guests, including William Hartung, director of the Weapons and Security Project at the Center for International Policy, former U.S. Army colonel and diplomat Anne Wright, Angelo Pinto, one of the founding members of the Justice League New York City, and senior attorney with Advancement Project working to end the school to prison pipeline, and Sierra Taylor of the People's Education Project and the Poor People's Campaign. I'll be back in a moment to tell you more about what you're about to see and hear, so please stay with us. guests, we'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the role some members of Congress are taking to end war. A number of representatives are right now working on legislation that could bring an end to U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen, a war that has created the worst humanitarian crisis of modern times. Let's hear from Congress member Rokhana. We have overextended our military to every quarter in the world in a way that is undermining our values and undermining our national security. This is not what our founders envisioned. George Washington warned about entanglement overseas. John Quincy Adams warned about entanglement overseas. Yet we now have a military budget that is approaching $700 billion, more than the next 12 countries combined. I am one of the few House Democrats who voted against these military increases. Why? Because we don't need to have 17 countries with combat troops. We don't need to have troops stationed in 150 countries around the world. We don't need over 100 special operation forces fighting across the world. That's not making us safer. And it is in fact creating greater conflict and putting Americans at risk. Instead, what we need is a restraint in our hard power and a leadership with our soft power, our values. We ought to be leading in solving climate change, leading in solving global poverty, leading in exporting music, art, culture, leading in figuring out how to provide primary education in our nation and provide some base education and nutrition to kids around the world. That's what's gonna make America respected around the world when we stand up for our values. What is compromising our values is the entanglement in foreign conflicts, which we can't win. One of the cases with this is our support of the Saudis and the coalition in the war in Yemen. It's a civil war. Why are we involved in helping the Saudis kill, kill innocent civilians in this war. We should have no complicity in aiding the Saudis in their campaign in Yemen. We have no national interest, and certainly it's not consistent with our values. Instead, what America ought to be doing is providing humanitarian assistance to Yemen, working with Special Envoy Griffith in solving the issue by bringing the Houthis and the coalition to the peace table. We should be pushing for opening the ports. We need to be a voice for the conscience of the world we shouldn't be promoting our military uh, in every corner of the world. So I applaud you for getting together and seeing how we can restrain our interventionism in a way that is more consistent with American values. Now that we have gotten an idea of some of the congressional work being done to end militarism, 
let's talk with an expert who can give us an idea of just how big the problem of militarism is. Bill Hartung is the director of the Weapons and Security Project at the Center for International Policy. He is the author of Prophets of War, Lockheed Martin, and the Making of the Military Industrial Complex. Bill specializes in issues of weapons proliferation, military spending, and alternative approaches to national security. He has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Nation, and World Policy Journal. He's been on 60 Minutes, CNN, Fox News, and more. Welcome, Bill. Can you Thanks, tell man. us about the <clears throat> wars that the U.S. is currently involved in and the size of the U.S. Uh, Pentagon budget? Well, there's a couple things to look at. The Cost of War Project at Brown University has estimated that the post-9-1-1 wars waged by the United States have cost $5.6 trillion, about three times as much as what they claimed we needed to reduce the deficit, enough to pay for a huge infrastructure program, free college, uh, dealing with inequality. So there's been a huge waste of resources on a uh, domestic front. Uh, and then there's at least seven major wars. Um, there's Iraq, there's Syria, there's Afghanistan, there's Pakistan, there's Somalia, there's Libya, uh, there's Yemen. And as uh, Representative Khanna mentioned, many other places where U.S. Special Forces are located, you know, well over 100, 800 military bases. So the United States is the only country in the world that has this kind of global military reach. And the myth is that somehow we need it for the security of the average American. Uh, but actually what it's for is to promote the interests of the military industrial complex and to protect uh, privileged investment situations for certain corporations. So um, the whole notion of national security coming from spending $700 billion a year on the military is probably one of the biggest myths that we have to combat. Uh, if you want to be safe, you should deal with climate change, you should deal with poverty, you should deal with the spread of disease. Uh, these are the issues that are going to make people safe. Uh, dealing with gun violence and so forth. So um, this whole notion that national security flows from throwing money at big corporations, uh, I think is ludicrous. How does the U.S. Pentagon budget compare with the military budgets of other countries? Depending which measure you use, it's between uh, as much as the next eight or the next 11 countries combined. Uh, the increase over the last two years is larger than the entire military budget of Russia. Uh, we spend about two and a half times what China spends. So there's really no comparison. And of course, of those eight countries, many of them are U.S. NATO allies. So if you look at sort of the U.S. and its allies r relative to the rest of the world, uh, there's no comparison. And of course, Iran uh, is barely a blip on the screen in terms of what they spend uh, compared to the U.S. or what they spend compared to the Saudis. And yet we're right now considering ideas of taking military action against Iran. You wrote an entire book on Lockheed Martin. Could you tell us a bit of detail about this weapons giant? Well, starting in the present, um, you know, they get about $50 billion a year from the U.S. government for weapons, for working on homeland security, for a variety of other tasks. And um, that's bigger than the budget of the U.S. State Department. So that tells you our priorities right there. Um, and they build bombs, they build fighter aircraft, they build combat ships. Um, they recently pulled out of uh, building landmines because of pressure from the movement. So they're not unbeatable on every front. I think it's important when we talk about the military industrial complex, there's a lot more of us than there are of them. I think if people understood the role they're playing, we could roll back their power. Uh, because I don't like to give a talk where everybody walks away and says, oh, you're right, Bill, you know, they are so powerful, I'm going to go to the beach. You know, it's, it's really about fighting them. Um, so, but they have a long history of scandal. Uh, they were involved in all kinds of foreign bribery in the 70s, which led to the creation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, they were the ones who, uh, the, you know, the $600 coffee pot, $600 toilet seat, $7,000 coffee pot, there was a scandal under Reagan, was built to go into their aircraft. Um, of course, they're a big supplier of weapons being used in Yemen, as are Boeing and Raytheon and General Dynamics. Uh, so almost every element of what's wrong about the military-industrial complex, Lockheed Martin has been a part of it. 
uh, they're a merger of a whole bunch of companies. It used to be just Lockheed and Martin Marietta, and they merged. They gobbled up many other companies. So they were also part of that merger wave of the 90s, uh, which was uh, given the blessing of the Clinton administration. And that's why they're such a big behemoth now. They're more powerful than they were, say, 20, 30 years ago. And yet the American public seems to have a lot of faith in um, our military and these weapons companies. And often this is phrased as a jobs program from the weapons companies. Could you talk a bit about uh, dispelling that myth? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is <clears throat> these companies are no friends of our veterans or our military. Uh, they create defective equipment. Uh, they suck up money that should be used to take care of veterans when they come back from wars. Uh, but they like to wrap themselves in the flag and use the plight of veterans as kind of the poster child for getting more money for themselves. Um, there's a new documentary coming out called Who Killed Lieutenant Van Dorn, which is about a helicopter pilot who died in a crash because of faulty maintenance, because of the greed of the contractors, who basically shift money towards building big new weapons instead of taking care of the actual weapons uh, that people in our military are using. So um, this kind of link between the military and the veterans and the companies is really more of a public relations stunt uh, than it is a reality. Uh, and of course, if you really want to help our veterans, we've got to stop these wars uh, because there's people coming back with traumatic brain injuries, with post-traumatic stress syndrome, losing limbs, uh, living their lives. And that has huge impact on communities around the country. Now, a lot of vets voted for Trump because they felt they had been poorly treated by the system, which they were. Uh, but he's doubled down on militarism, despite the fact that when he ran, he said the Iraq war was a disaster. His second favorite epithet for Hillary Clinton after crooked Hillary was Hillary the hawk. Uh, and all of that was just kind of positioning for him. It was a way to beat up on Jeb Bush. It was a way to kind of position Hillary Clinton in a certain place. And so a lot of people believe that. And I think some of his voters are actually anti-war. Uh, they may be isolationist. Many have many other problems that we're all aware of. But there is an anti-war strain that goes beyond Democrats or independents. It's actually in that, uh, you know, uh, sort of Trump block. And if even a small number of those came around, uh, his power would be diminished uh, significantly. So we've talked a little bit about the effect that wars have on veterans and how devastating uh, this is here in the U.S. Can you talk a bit about the devastation overseas and the effect of U.S. engagement in the Middle East over time, how that causes destabilization? Well, by a very conservative estimate, um, 330,000 people have died in the post-9-1 wars. If you look at the spread of disease and the effects afterwards, it, it would be much higher. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you referenced in Iraq, uh, once the country was largely destroyed, uh, a sectarian regime came to power with U.S. support, uh, which cracked down on Sunnis around the country, which created a position where when ISIS swept in from the north, a lot of people didn't trust the Iraqi government. They thought things couldn't get any worse. A lot of their troops were not being paid because of corruption. A lot of the weapons were not being supplied. So the rise of ISIS was uh, a consequence of the intervention in Iraq. So uh, as often happens with military intervention, it causes more problems than it solves. And we've seen that in Iraq. We've seen that in support for Saudi Arabia. We've seen that in Libya and Somalia, around the world. So uh, despite that, uh, a lot of the press, for example, says things like, well, you know, if we don't use force, uh, what are we going to do? You know, as if military force is the only thing that counts as action, as opposed to diplomacy, as opposed to people-to-people -people interactions, as opposed to all the things that actually would work to make us safer. But, you know, nothing blows up. There's no good pictures for TV. Uh, and so there's a bias uh, against, uh, you know, peace and diplomacy. And in fact, when we have successes, they're often misrepresented or it's not pointed out that a lot of them came because of activism. It wasn't just because a couple people in Washington, you know, woke up and decided to do a good thing today. Uh, and unfortunately, members like Representative Khanna, who we heard from, are still in the minority. If we had a majority of Congress who believe what he did, we'd have a much different country and a much different foreign policy. But that would only happen with a much larger uh, level of public pressure. Uh, 
you know, voting alone is not going to get it done. But uh, when you've got people in the streets, that's when historically we've been able to make major changes in our country. Thank you so much, and thank you for being part of the movement to um, support that public pressure. We will speak to you again shortly. We'll be back in a moment with other experts on U.S. militarism, and we'll hear about the effects of the war machine on our communities and what's being done. I'm Ariel Gold, and you're watching a town hall on militarism from Code Pink, Free Speech TV, and Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Welcome back. We'll now be broadening our discussion by hearing from those who know firsthand about the destructive impact of militarism. They will also tell us about grassroots work they are involved in to build a more peaceful and just world. We're joined now by three other prominent experts, retired U.S. Army colonel and diplomat turned activist Anne Wright, Angelo Pinto of the Justice League New York City, and Sierra Taylor of the Poor People's Campaign and the People's Education Project. Anne, let's start with you. You resigned from the U.S. government at the start of the Iraq War in opposition. Could you talk a bit about what it's been like to go from being inside the military to protesting the military? And could you tell us a bit about foreign bases around the world? Sure. Well, as you can well imagine, uh, moving from the U.S. government, the empire, into uh, communities that have been challenging the empire and U.S. government policies for decades, for their whole lives, was quite a transition for me. But it was a wonderful transition. I'm, I'm now with people who are, the, are true patriots. I mean, they are very concerned about their country, and they're very concerned about how much money we're spending on killing other people around the world. You know, we do have U.S. military bases in over eight uh, or over 800 military bases in 150 or more countries. Every state in the United States of America has military bases in it. Uh, we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars on weapons to kill other people. I mean, we are killing them with assassin drones. You talk about citizen activism. Well, we do have a, a strong citizen activism community against these assassin drones that are killing people in at least 10 different countries. The United States is killing people uh, by bombing assassin drones in over seven countries that we know about. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's outrageous how much money we are spending on the deaths of people around the world. I mean, I just came back from Istanbul, um, and there we were talking about uh, the, the murder of a, of a Saudi journalist in the Saudi uh, consulate. And you, you think about what is Saudi Arabia doing with American weapons, the huge amount of weaponry that we are selling, over $100 billion worth of weapons. We look at $3 billion that we are giving to Israel every single year that's being used to buy weapons or create weapons that are used to kill Palestinians in the open air prison called Gaza, where Gaza is the laboratory for U.S. military weapons that are being used by the Israelis on Palestinians. So as, as a citizen, uh, joining with groups all over the world, really, uh, because I was in Istanbul for an international conference on Jerusalem and Palestine, and I will be going in, in two weeks from now here it is, Veterans Day and Armistice Day, the end of uh, 100 years since the end of World War I, uh, and yet the wars continue. Mm -hmm. And in two weeks, I'll be going to Dublin, Ireland, where we have an international coalition conference on stopping U.S. military bases all over the world. So it is an international collective effort that we challenge uh, the U.S. military propensity for wars uh, wherever the United States decides. It is in its national, I wouldn't say security interest, but corporate interest. Right. Yeah, so um, we, are, we are alive, we are well, we're kicking, we are challenging uh, uh, the United States propensity uh, to kill other people around the world. And we will win this fight. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> There's not just a war. There's not just wars going on overseas, but we have a war going on right here in the U.S. against our own citizens, 
Angelo, you're one of the founding members of the Justice League New York City, a task force of juvenile and criminal justice advocates and formerly incarcerated individuals. Since 2016, you've been a senior attorney with the Advancement Project, working to end the school-to-prison pipeline. Can you tell us about trends you see in the militarization of the U.S. police? Definitely. And, you know, before I even get into that, one of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about militarization, you know, was the thought that you can't talk about militarization unless you talk about war. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk about militarization unless you talk about the psychological toll and the physical toll of militarization on so many people. Um, and now you can't talk about militarization without talking about policing. Um, and when I think about policing around this country, one of the things that is, is just clear way in which you've seen the militarization of policing is this military-grade equipment that local police departments have, um, which, of course, is now counting in the billions. But if you take a look at what happened in Ferguson, when you had protesters who were saying a innocent boy should not have been left in the street for hours, and we have something to say about it, it was met with tanks and tear gas. And the question must become, why are citizens of America met with that? Um, but I think it also begs the question of why is anyone around the world met with that kind of force for simply protesting what they believe is right? Um, but around the country now, I think in the United States, and I mean, you could look in, in, in a city like New York, and you see a, a, the way in which police forces have been militarized. Um, and we often talk about the prison industrial complex and the ways in which prisons have proliferated around the country. And in New York State, folks often say, you know, the prison population is decreasing. There's less folks in prisons in New York State who are winning. And I often say to folks, no, you have to pay a a cl take a closer look at this. And really what's happening is as the prison population and jail population is shrinking very slightly, what you see now is prisons and populations popping up, popping up in communities. Mm -hmm. You're seeing police um, forces occupy communities, just how folks are occupied in prisons and in jails around the state. Um, and I think we have to start to take a closer look and look at things in that way. That, um, as Ann mentioned, you have open-air prisons popping up in communities around the country. And it's really the way in which policing has been militarized. Um, and when I think about the founding of this country, the reality was it was militari militarizing the land or people trying to take the resources from folks through military. Um, and now the United States, and the United States has for a while, has decided that through military it will police the world. Um, and we have to pay attention to that. I think we can't talk about militarization without talking about policing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll be back soon with the rest of our discussion. You're watching The U.S. War Machine, How Can We Stop the Violence? a joint production of Code Pink, Free Speech TV, and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion of the U.S. war machine, How Can We Stop the Violence? We're talking with a panel of experts and activists about the effects of U.S. militarism and work being done to change things. We're now going to speak with Sierra Taylor of the Popular Education Project, the Poor People's Campaign, and the People's Forum, a political education and cultural center for organizers, activists, and artists in Midtown Manhattan. Sierra, the Poor People's Campaign is a continuation of Dr. Martin Luther King's work to address uh, poverty, racism, and militarism. Can you talk about why militarism is included in those three? Why is it so important? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in 1968, when Dr. King and many others uh, in movements across the country began the Poor People's Campaign, they began with understanding that there was a war that was happening on the poor of this country, as well as internationally. And so what the Poor People's Campaign has lifted up traditionally are the three evils of militarism, of white supremacy, and of materialism. And I think that today we also talk about the importance of lifting up ecological devastation and those evils as well, because you see how they overlap. And I think the significance of the Poor People's Campaign is how it has been able to unite people um, in seemingly different struggles and, and different experiences for us to understand how all of our struggles, how all of our oppressions are interconnected. 
And so when you look at the issue of militarization and, and, and militarism, like both of these panelists have said, um, you're seeing instances where there has been violence that is playing out on our people here in the United States as well as our people internationally, um, whether it's uh, militarism that is being excused because uh, these people look people look different than us, uh, uh, different colors of skin, uh, different race, uh, different economic situation. What we're seeing is that um, we're, our communities are being attacked and are allowed to continue being attacked because we've been isolated. And so by expanding the conversation around militarism to include the ways in which uh, systemic racism, in which um, hyper uh, policing in which surveillance um, of which our lands are being destroyed by military bases, by uh, by gas pipelines, by fracking, um, you're able to see how this is not just an issue of wars abroad and wars on the other, but it's really an issue uh, on everyone, an issue of the war against the poor um, and the dispossessed of this country and around the world. If you were to name one thing that people could do to help deal with this issue and to get involved, and I'll pose this to all three of you, what would you suggest? I think the, the best thing to do is to be able to dissect um, this issue of militarization. Mm -hmm. I think that we're able to see how militarism is being impacted by different actors, whether it's um, state actors like, you know, the Department of Defense and intelligence agencies um, and the military. You know, you see the traditional use of the Army um, of now uh, law enforcement offices. Uh, you see the non-traditional uh, state government organizations uh, like these NGOs, you're seeing the use of uh, privatization, these uh, big corporations that are uh using surveillance and hyper-policing abroad and in our communities, and you're also seeing the ways in which culture and our society is furthering militarization. Um, anything as small as wearing camo gear yeah. to uh, having military-grade um, weapons in our, uh, our communities, and even on the TV screen and the movies. You know, when you're seeing military uh, tanks and planes being used in the movies, not only are these movies uh, paying the U.S military to use this equipment, the U.S. military also has to approve of the script of the movies. And so you're seeing culturally how our society has been militarized. And so I think that when you're pulling apart the issue of militarization and you're able to see the different ways these different institutions um, and even us in our everyday lives are consenting to the violence in this country and the violence that is being prep perpetuated um, against poor communities around the world, we're able to see the little things that we can do. The little things, uh, little is not wearing camouflage, little things of not joining the ROTC or not having our children join the ROTC in high school, um, to being able to uh, create jobs, green jobs that can resist um, the poverty draft and people feeling as though they have to join the military in order to make a living or go to college, offering different alternatives. I think that we all all have a role we can play in ending militarism. Um, I think we just have to pull it apart and see what we're already doing to consent, um, even non-verbally, to the system of violence. Well, and after you've done the analysis that Sierra has done so well, and you've picked out a couple of the, the things that really um, grab your heart, the injustices that are happening, then find allies. Yes. And yeah. we have a tremendous number of allies you can, you can find in the United States. I mean, Code Pink Women for Peace, a great ally, yeah. Yeah. yeah, a great group of women and men. Veterans for Peace, That's if you're right. a veteran, come That's or right. an ally for Veterans for Peace. You know, we have over a thousand organizations in the United States that have peace or justice in their names. Over a thousand of them in your community. There are organizations that are already there. It's easier to work with allies. It's easier to work with other people in solidarity because yeah. you can have you can have, I wouldn't say fun, but you can have <laughs> solidarity, solidarity with other people that are like-minded. It's so much easier to work with people that, you know, you kind of have similar views to form a group that can now work with other people that may not have your views, yeah. but the other people can say, well, there's at least two or three or four people that are kind of thinking this. Maybe I should think with them, uh, or at least listen to them. 
And you never can tell what crazy things you run into. I mean, <laughs> all of us have had crazy things happening uh, in these organizations, things that are, are meaningful for the rest of our lives. So look in your community, find some well, find the issues you want to work on, and peace, social justice, stopping wars, I think, are some of the top <laughs> ones, and keeping people out of prison and helping them Certainly. when they come out of prison. Um, but we have groups that, that are there, so please join us today. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, such great points. You know, when folks often talk about the criminal justice system and mass incarceration, we talk about the punishment paradigm and how it's a paradigm of punishment, why we continue to think this will work. And we know it's failed and it's failed time and time again. And when I think about militarization, there's kind of this paradigm around violence. Um, and I think we have, folks often say to decolonize the world, you have to decolonize yourself. And I think there's ways in which we have to unpack the real-time ways in which we believe violence works mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which we use violence in small ways and in big ways in our life, the ways in which we see the police use violence and think it's okay, to the way we see the military use violence and we think it's okay. We have to unpack that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you do have to partner with organizations that are doing that work. And then you have to hold your elected officials accountable. Um, when I look at the reason why police departments are getting military-grade equipment, the reason why officers are using deadly force, um, it's because elected officials and DAs and many folks are allowing this to happen. Um, and the only way you really confront that in a real-time way is by saying this is unacceptable and this is not what we're going to concede to. So I think we have to do all of those things. We have to unpack the paradigm of violence that we've kind of inherited um, and that we own in our day-to-day -day life. We have to organize and work with organizations who are doing this work, and then we have to hold elected officials and the government accountable as far as we can to really start to undo some of these things before we get in a very dangerous place. In a moment, we're going to open this up to our live studio audience for questions. Welcome back to our Town Hall on Militarism, a joint production of Code Pink, Free Speech TV, and Manhattan Neighborhood Network. We're going to be taking questions from our live studio audience for all of our panelists. Go ahead. Thank you. This is a great panel. My name is Michael Twig. I'm from U.S. Labor Against the War. We're an organization of about 160 union locals, central labor councils, state federations. And in the labor movement, there's concern about the wars, there's a concern to have peace, but there's also a concern about jobs. And the military industrial complex creates a lot of jobs, and they're in every congressional district in the United States. And what we find is a question, well, what about our jobs? And there are answers about conversion and just transition to other kinds of jobs and environment and so on, but I'm wondering if the panel could uh, you know, sort of illuminate this question where are the jobs? How can we deal with this question? Because it's so central in the lives of working people in the United States. Well, I'll take a crack at that. I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's really a political problem when you come down to it, because uh, military spending is the least effective way to create jobs. Uh, if you invest in infrastructure or green energy, you get about one and a half times as many jobs as you get building weapons. Uh, but of course, Congress isn't funding that. They're funding weapons, so people will take the jobs that are available and offer to them. So part of it is breaking the logjam in Washington to invest in things we need. Uh, but even if you do that, the jobs aren't going to track. You know, if, if you're hiring more teachers, a machinist isn't necessarily going to get a job as a teacher. So there's got to be some transition money uh, to help people get new skills, find new jobs. I think there's got to be local and regional planning you know, to help figure out, okay, what industry are we going to build around instead of this military base or this weapons contractor? Uh, and it is concentrated. You know, the industry would like us to think it's in every town and every village, and it's not entirely the case. There's really big concentrated areas like St. Louis, where Bell Boeing built fighter planes, or Texas, where Lockheed Martin builds combat aircraft, uh, Southern California, Washington State, Florida. I mean, it adds up. Massachusetts, of course. Ohio, they build tanks. And so one of the things that does, of course, is it compromises Congress, because you have members who are Democrats who say, well, yeah, I'm generally uh, for peace, but I can't give up this weapon that's in my state or district. Mm -hmm. Enough people do that, and you've locked in the whole right. Pentagon budget. So I think 
uh, we need to pay more attention to the jobs issue because it cuts across everything. I mean, you know, climate change, they say, well, what about the coal industry? You know, if we invested in green energy and green technologies, there's a huge global market for that, much bigger than the arms market. A lot of the jobs you can't export. If you're weatherizing a house, you can't do it in China. The house is here, you know. So I think it's probably an issue that the peace movement hasn't really cracked or maybe spent enough time on. You know, of course, the humanitarian disasters that these wars cause mm -hmm. get the immediate attention. But if we're going to break the cycle, then the jobs issue has to be addressed, I think, more seriously than we have so far. Uh, my, my question is, uh, so thank you very much for this discussion. Divestment. Each of us can do something about it. Are your organizations, are you personally speaking to people about where are you banking? Where's your money going? Uh, as an organization, but also as an individual, we can do something about this. And here in New York City, we have a bank, Amalgamated Bank, that has made policies that are not, uh, they're saying we will have nothing to do with any transactions with any weapons. So citizens in, the, in New York and around our country really need to know that we have people on our side within the system, too. And the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons that 122 countries adopted last year that our country is ignoring. We have now a city council, New York City Council, looking into divestment. Uh, over half our members, city council members, are wanting to divest from our pension funds here in New York City, $194 billion. So each one of your organizations, I hope, is getting the word out that you as an individual can do something. And money is where it counts. Same with the prison system. We can take the money out of the things that are really doing harm and put the money into the things that we really need. So just wanted to say, is this part of your campaign, this divestment move? Thank you. God bless. Uh, well, Code Pink, as you may or may not know, is, is leading a campaign on divesting from the war machine. And financial pressure has been part of some of our biggest accomplishments in our history. Yep. The anti-apartheid movement, United Farm Workers organizing, uh, there was a campaign that got GE to get out of the nuclear weapons business. There's a campaign now called Don't Bank on the Bomb, which is getting banks to stop financing nuclear weapons. And they have a very useful list of who the major producers are. Uh, so I, I think that's an important way to go because uh, people have some influence, even in small ways, of where they put their bank account, how they spend their dollars. There's been um, some successes on the international front. For example, a group in the UK helped pressure Lockheed Martin to stop building illegal cluster munitions by getting the banks to lean on them. Some of the banks are quite sensitive to not want to be involved with weapons that have been stigmatized. And in the case of the UK, I think the bank folded after three days of a public campaign. So I think we need to look at the where the vulnerabilities are. I think what people fear is, though, it wasn't that their whole economy. But you look at the weak points, and you start momentum and then I think you can make a difference, just as the farm workers started by boycotting one company and then spread out to get contracts across the way. So I think there's some strategy involved, but I absolutely agree it's, it's a tactic we have to use. And Code Pink has a, what is it, a 30-page uh, document that lists all of the, the major uh, weapons manufacturers and pressure points that you can have with them. So codepink.org. Divestment. Divest. <laughs> uh, our Divest from the War Machine campaign focuses both on institutions like universities, uh, financial institutions like banks, as well as getting uh, weapons money out of, mem out of Congress, asking members of Congress not to take campaign contributions from companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon. And you can get involved at codepink.org slash divest. I want to thank you very much. Thanks to Code Pink and to all of you for being here today and raising these really important issues. I'm Tom Gogan. I uh, work with uh, U.S. Labor Against the War as well as Veterans for Peace. And, um, and segueing from that whole issue of divestment, uh, there was a uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors a, a little over a year ago uh, passed an important resolution uh, here in New York, our own mayor uh, voted for it, but we've heard nothing. It uh, calls for divesting from uh, nuclear power and uh, nuclear weapons, and also it calls for city councils to hold hearings on the impacts of, uh, of uh, military spending on our towns and cities. 
Um, so my question to you is, to, is it, could this be a, a part of the divestment campaign that you're thinking about, and wouldn't this be an, another way to bring uh, our sort of local politics into um, the whole question of what's, what's happening with military spending and how is that impacting our communities, our jobs, our people? Well, I think it's an excellent way to, to do it that we, uh, we go to our city councils and we say, look at all the places that, we, that, that our local monies are being used um, uh, uh, to support these um, weapons manufacturers. Yeah, I think it's an excellent way to do it, to, to go after the U.S. Conference of Mayors again and get even more buy-in to not only ending nuclear weapons uh, involvement, but the whole divestment from the war machine. And I think it takes a lot of work to get a city council or a mayor to take a stand. It takes just as much work to get them to live up to it. Right. Uh, because they can that. get a lot of credit for saying something nice, mm -hmm. but then to go and do it, and of course that's when the counter pressure will come. Once we've gotten them to say that, then the weapons manufacturers and people who profit from it will say, well, you don't really want to do that. I mean, say it is one thing, but you know, okay. just don't go ahead with it. Right. And, and there's a tremendous amount of other costs that end up trickling down, like when I think about the ways in which um, po local police departments have military-grade equipment, and now, like we were talking earlier, in Florida, there is this legislation that passed that said there must be a police officer in every school, and if they don't have the money to do that, they have to arm a teacher. And in some of these counties, they, the teachers were being paid less than some of, the, or as much as some of the janitorial staff. Right? So teachers were not even making livable wages in some of these counties. And now they were going to bring in a police officer who was going to get paid more, and this was going to take money out of the budget. And when you look at Florida as a state, the amount of money they have to pour into a program like this. So you see the ways in which this desire to, to militarize or this desire to place more guns in the hands of people across the board takes money from a lot of places that needs it. Um, so, and like I was saying before, where you have a school becomes a lot more like a jail, right? And you're, you're putting more money into the folks who are going to have guns in the school as opposed to the teachers who are teaching the children. Um, so I think we have to think about the ways in which that happens. But I think the other piece to divestment is after you make folks divest who used to invest, I think the other piece is what kind of accountability, accountability do they have on the back end? If you put all of this money into war, you put all this money into funding folks who cause chaos around the world, what kind of accountability do you have after that? And I think that's an important question that we don't have. Um, in New York State, when we were talking about 16 and 17 year olds who were prosecuted as adults, and many of them who died in facilities, who were murdered in facilities, mm -hmm. or went home and committed suicide, mm -hmm. we said someone should be held accountable for that, right? It's not enough to say, we're gonna stop doing this now. Okay, stop doing that, and now for all the years that you did it, there needs to be some recourse. There are millions of lives that have been ruined behind this. What do we do for those folks? It's not enough to just say, okay, we'll halt now. No, no, no. There has to be an accountability system set up to undo some of that trauma. One useful tool is the uh, National Priorities Project, which is at the Institute for Policy Studies. They can break down the trade-offs down to the city level, the congressional district level, so you can explain to people what they're giving up in terms mm -hmm. of services, because you're spending money on a fighter plane you don't need or a war you shouldn't be fighting. Hi, um, I'm Mark Elliott Stein. I'm with World Beyond War. And um, as a peace activist, one thing I'm continually aware of is that a pro-military mindset is not just a problem with the government, not just a problem with Wall Street, but actually war is, is deeply ingrained in the spirit of many people I know. And I'm wondering what do we do as anti-war activists to um, help people get over their fear of, of people from other countries, um, fear of people from this country, um, I, the, the fear that drives the popularity of the NRA, that drives um, pro-war candidates being elected, mm -hmm. and so on. Alice Slater, Code Pink, and World Beyond War, and uh, the new ICANN campaign that got a treaty negotiated, and, and a, a thousand other groups. <laughs> but that's my question. How do we bring it all together? And we have a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. 
with this terrible report from the UN climate panel that we have 12 years or we're down the tubes. So how about our anti-war movement and our justice movement and our saying time out Mm -hmm. We cannot spend another dime. We cannot hire another soldier. We have to gear up. I mean, like some kind of change in our conversation. Yeah. So, because we have all the solutions. I mean, we do. I mean, New York, we, if we can do it here, we do it anywhere, right? And, and <laughs> we have offshore wind. We're like the Saudi Arabia of wind. And remember in Massachusetts, they were so upset they didn't want to look at the windmills? New York miraculously has a very shallow seabed that goes out over the horizon. You never even have to look at the windmills. And we could power up the whole eastern seaboard and have all the jobs that we need that can, as Bill said so eloquently, we can't ship them to China. They have to be done here. You know? mm. So I wonder if we're thinking about how we can take this new crisis Really, it's a planetary crisis. We're all in bed together with this all over the world and use it to turn the tables on militarism. Well, I'll, uh, on the first question, I think one of the things we have to realize about our population uh, and its propensity to kind of go along with these wars, you know, what the government gets us in a war, okay, we just kind of go along with it, although in 2003, uh, 2003, massive demonstrations were against the war on Iraq. But if you look now at, what, at our own population of the kids that are under 17 years old, uh, that, that population, that demographic is probably at least 15%, if not more, of our population of the United States. And they've, they, they are nothing other than, than the U.S. being at war someplace. So the, the normalization of what our government does and the population kind of going, well, uh, it, that's just the way it is. We always are killing people someplace. I mean, that's we've got to get this thing stopped and to to figure out that way of how you you get people elected who are not going to go along with this. The electoral system is one of the things we have to look at for sure because we keep getting into power those people who seem to like war. And it doesn't matter which party it is. I mean, they're kind of equal opportunity warmongers. Mm -hmm. So it is up to us as the citizenry to, uh, to first educate our kids of what really the reality of, of humanity ought to be, which is it isn't at war all the time. Uh, and then find the good folks who will stand for election and get them elected so that our political system will reflect the values which I think are the values of the majority of the United States, I hope. Well, on climate change, <clears throat> I think, you know, the point you made about that there are solutions, I think is hugely important because a lot of people feel like it's yeah. too big, they can't deal with it. I'll just, you know, watch Netflix, uh, <laughs> you know, even as the world burns. And of course, there's a there's a racial element. I yes. mean, if you look how they treated the hurricane in Puerto Rico mm. and how Trump is still denying that people have died there. Yes. Uh, so I, I think it can knit things together because it's really about, well, what is actually dangerous? It's not terrorism. Uh, it's not fighting wars around the world that's going to make us safe. It's dealing with the biggest challenge probably in the history of humanity, uh, along with nuclear weapons. And so I think you know, the, the trick is for people to find ways to do this while not giving up on the other important issues they're working on. Uh, because if you're subject to gun violence or police violence or, you know, that happens today and tomorrow, yeah. climate change really is not that far off either. I mean, it's happening as we speak. Uh, so it's, you know, how to integrate those. But I think it's certainly doable. And, and we do need a positive agenda. And we do need to deal with the dangers that are real, which I think also can undercut some of the irrational fears. If we're working on the real problem, I think it might be easier to come together and acknowledge that some of the other things people are afraid of are not actually the things to be scared of, you know. I think race plays an important role. Um, when I was doing a lot of work looking at the way in which prisons are throughout New York State and how they, the system has grown, and I would start to say to myself, this isn't a good jobs program. You could create much more jobs doing something else. And I said, so why would someone continue to, why would a state continue to invest in something like this? And then I started to realize 
because there's, there's this great research that was done that said most of the people incarcerated in New York State come from New York City, over 75 percent of them. And most of those people come from a handful of neighborhoods, mm -hmm. your South Bronx, South Jamaica, Queens, your Harlems, right? So you, you realize that part of this is about social control for a certain group of individuals, yes. right? It isn't that this is a good idea, um, but this is actually, uh, this is someone able to feed their fear. Um, or their perceived fear, or the fear they want to um, kind of spread throughout to other folks. And I think the same mm -hmm. is true why we won't implement certain answers we know would work. Um, and there's people who profit off of this mm -hmm. tremendously, That's right? Mm -hmm. so, there's, so there's that other component to it. And, but one of the things I was thinking about to both questions was systems, right? Um, and I often say in order to confront a system, you must build a system, right? And we're trying to confront some of the biggest systems or industrial complexes when you talk about the military, the military industrial complex, it doesn't really get much bigger than that in the United States. But we haven't, from my opinion, created the kind of system that's integrated with organizations, um, campaigns to divest and invest, to hold folks accountable, to, to make elected officials do what they need to do, so that we have build an adequate system to start to dismantle this military industrial complex and also build something out. You know, one of the things that the Poor People's Campaign really talks about is pulling from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea about the revol uh, revolution of values. Mm -hmm. I think that often in our movements, we're so concerned with making sure that people's feelings aren't hurt, that we're not having real conversations about what side you're on. You're either on the side of the people or you're on the side of profit. You're either on the side of the workers and the oppressed or you're on the side of the oppressors. And I think that we have to understand what side that we're on and stop allowing petty differences yeah. to divide us as they have for so long. Um, and we understand, we seen through revolutionary moments throughout time that when the poor come together, when the dispossessed come together, when the marginalized come together, that's where change happens. We've done it before with the movements in slavery, when we had uh, enslaved uh, African descendants, white folks, indigenous folks in this country rising up together to end the system of slavery from a values perspective. Um, you're seeing it in, in revolutions the world over, the Russian Revolution. Yeah. 150 ethnic groups came together to oppose the czar, and that's how they won. I mean, we have to study these movements. We have to study how people were able to put aside the issues that seemingly divide us, issues like race, issues like gender, issues like sexual orientation, and understand that we're all in this shit together, and we have to fight together to get out of it, and that's the only way that we're going to win. That's true. We're just about out of time, so please join me in thanking our guests on this special program, The U.S. War Machine, What's Happening and How Can We Stop the Violence, a joint production of Code Pink, Free Speech TV, and Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, Bill Hartung, for your expertise in framing the problem, Anne Wright, for your service as a tireless activist and outspoken critic of U.S. foreign policy, Angelo Pinto for your work with incarcerated youth, Sierra Taylor for being a part of this tremendous campaign to carry on Dr. King's work. From the Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios, I'm Arielle Gold of Code Pink, and you've been watching The U.S. War Machine what's happening, and how can we stop the violence on Free Speech TV.